Good afternoon. It is October 5th, 1998. We're here at the Morse Institute Library in Natick, Massachusetts. This afternoon we have the pleasure of in, uh, introducing and interviewing Mr. Donald F. Calhoun. Good afternoon, Mr. Calhoun. Good afternoon. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you for joining us today. Can you tell us what your current address is? Here in Natick. And how long have you lived there? I've lived there since uh, 1964, so what does that make it, 34 years? Mm -hmm. And you are married? I'm married. Your wife's name? Sandra. And you have some children, I understand. I have a uh, son and a daughter. Mm -hmm. And do you mind my asking you your age? No, not at all. And I'm how 64. 64 years old. Mm -hmm. Where were you born and raised? I was born in Atlanta, Georgia, and I was raised in Atlanta uh, until I was 17 years old. What made you decide to move to Na the Natick area? Uh, well, my wife and my son at the time, and uh, subsequently a daughter, were living in Bill Rick and we were living in a rental house. So uh, I was working with Raytheon and I needed a, uh, a place that had a good school system that uh, uh, I could move my family to. So we, we were buying a house, so we didn't want to stay in Bill Rick, so we moved to Natick. And at the time, it was a uh, you know, nice, nice neighborhood. And do you still feel that way? No, I think the Bacon Street has become a thoroughfare and a regular highway, and it, uh, it's just too much traffic. Yeah. Other than Bacon Street, have you seen any other major changes since you moved into town in oh, yeah. 1964? Oh, yes. Uh, all the building, uh, uh, you name it, the, the malls. Uh, I can remember we used to take the kids to a drive-in movie on Speed Street, and uh, you know. <laughs> that's now <laughs> the Hampton Inn. Uh, that's right, yeah. Yes. Places like. Tell us a little bit about your family background growing up in Atlanta, Georgia. Well, I was uh, one of four children. I was the oldest of the four children. Uh, I had a brother and two sisters. Uh, <clears throat> I was in a single parent family, my mother and father had become divorced. It was a tough time, uh, you know, the depression and all of that type of thing. Uh, uh, we, I guess you would consider us poor, although we never missed a meal and we always had clean clothes. And did your mother work, uh, was it your mother that was raising you? Yes. And did she work outside of the home? Uh, she, she did at times. Uh, during the war she worked up at the, uh, in Marietta, Georgia, they had a, a bomber uh, factory there. It's, it's still there. It's a, the Lockheed plant now. But uh, she, she did work there, but uh, primarily we were on welfare. Uh, you we were on wel welfare? Yeah, we didn't call it welfare. We called it, uh, what did we call it? Can't remember. Maybe assistance or aid? Yes, things, things like that. Did you see your father? Uh, only on occasion, yeah. Mm -hmm. Did he support the family? Not at all, no. Mm -hmm. No. Being the oldest of four children, did you have responsibilities that the uh, that friends of yours did not have? Uh, yes, I did. Uh, I, I've al I always uh, felt that I had to work, even from a very young age, because of uh, you know the need for for income. And uh, being the oldest, I I guess I figured it was on me, you know. <laughs> sure. Were you able to finish high school at that time? Uh, I did not finish high school at the time. No. Mm -hmm. no. And when did you, did you make the decision yourself to join the military or were you called up or drafted? No, I, uh, I joined the Air Force the day I turned 17. Uh, I, jo I joined it for a number of reasons, but uh, I've always been a little bit patriotic. I've always liked the Air Force because I've always been interested in airplanes. Uh, <clears throat> I figured it was a place to learn a trade, a uh, place to have an income, and you could also uh, have a, uh, an allotment sent to your mother. And uh, those are the reasons. So you sent a portion of your check home each month oh, to yes. your mom? Yes, indeed. Mm -hmm. yeah. Did any other brothers, you said you had how one, one, one brother, brother. Did he, was he in the service at all during he, his career? Uh, yes, he, he uh, joined the uh, Army uh, roughly a year after I went into the Air Force. Did any of your friends join with you at that time? Uh, two, two friends joined uh, with me, yeah. We, uh, we had serial numbers that ran in sequence. Uh, <laughs> uh, 
Uh, we were all three together. But uh, what has happened to him since then, I, I haven't the slightest. When you joined with your friends, did you stay together in, for instance, the beginning, the basic training courses? Yes, we were in basic training together in the same, uh, same uh, squadron, same flight, they called it, same barracks. And where was your first experience as uh, an enlistee in the Air Force? Well, it would be at uh, Lackland Air Force Base, which is in San Antonio, Texas. Uh, which is the primary uh, basic training for the uh, base for the Air Force. Was that your first time out of your state? Uh, no, I had, uh, I had been into Florida, Florida a number of times because we had, uh, we have kin that lived in Miami. So we, I had been to, there. Do but, you remember uh, what it was like though when you first entered in Texas? Did you get a sense of what the area was like, or were, was it so structured that you didn't have the time? Uh, it, w it was structured. Uh, I, I could go to San Antonio and, and be totally lost. Uh, we, uh, we, f we flew in there, onto a bus, onto the base, uh, and you know, in a group from there on. Were you scared or interested in a new adventure? I guess a little bit of both. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, uh, <laughs> I, I wasn't. I, we, we all became kind of scared because when we were first introduced to our drill instructors, who were very nasty, mean people, you know, and uh, so we, we were scared. So their job was to make you have a bit of fear. Oh, right from the very beginning. I mean, as soon as you got off the bu uh, off the bus and into the indoctrination center, they lined you up and they started you marching right then and. Uh, they were calling you all sorts of names and uh, you name it. <laughs> now you joined in 1951. What was happening at that point in time uh, in the different services around the country and around the world? Well, <clears throat> the, uh, the Air Force had just become a separate uh, entity. It used to be the Army Air Corps. Uh, as, and it was such that uh, a lot of the uh, airmen were still wearing the old Army olive drab uniforms. Uh, the, uh, of course, the Korean War had been going on for about a year. Uh, well. Were you concerned that you might get involved with the Korean War? Well, that's one of the reasons I went in. Mm -hmm. yeah. That you had hoped that maybe you could be a part of that? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So you were in basic training in San Antonio. How long did that last? I was there for approximately eight, week, eight weeks. And during those eight weeks, were you able to develop additional friendships besides the buddies that had gone in with you? Not really, not really, no. Once you started in with your basic training, um, after certain drills, was there any specialty that they found that you might be good at and therefore helped to support that specialty? Uh, they, they found through testing uh, what they thought you were, you were good at and, and uh, my first, uh, first one, or the highest, uh, was in the medical field, uh, but that doesn't mean anything, you know, you're probably uh, orderlies or what have you. And the uh, second one was in the uh, administrative or the clerical field. Of course, uh, you didn't do anything there in, in, in basic other than uh, just be tested for these things. Mm -hmm. And after basic training, after eight weeks, what happened? Uh, after eight weeks, uh, I was, uh, I had finished basic, uh, I got promoted, got your PFC, one little stripe, and uh, uh, we, uh, I was assigned to Northwestern State College, which was in Natchitoches, Louisiana. That's N-A-T-C-H-I-T-O-C-H-E-S. Uh, it's the oldest town in the Louisiana Purchase, but you probably never heard of it. It's a nice little college town, and uh, I was sent there to, uh, to uh, take a clerk typist course. And it was nice because we, uh, you know, we gotten away from the military environment, uh, everybody yelling at you to a, living in a, uh, dormitories effectively like the students did, and we ate with the students and things like that. Did you have to wear uniforms at that time? Yes, we did. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And how long did that last? How did, long did the course last at the college? Uh, we were there 
uh, I believe, three months. Three months. Mm -hmm. And in, in three months, were you f a full-time student, basically? Yes. Mm -hmm. Did you have to take a test after that three-month period? Yes. Mm -hmm. you, uh, well, it was, uh, you also learned how to type, so you took typing tests as well as uh, other, uh, other tests and, uh, you know, military correspondence and all this type of stuff. Mm -hmm. Do you remember what a typical day might be like, start time, yeah. schooling? You would start about 8 o'clock in the morning and you would probably finish up about 4 o'clock in the afternoon. And uh, the day was mainly typing classes and this type of stuff. Yeah. Did you find it repetitive at times? Mm -hmm. And then did you have your evenings free or was it fairly structured? Uh, we did have our evenings free. Uh, we could uh, do what we wanted effectively, you know. You had a little, little homework, but uh, nothing, nothing big. Even though you were, you kind of stood out because you were in uniform, were you able to easily integrate into the college yeah. atmosphere with the other students, or yes. yeah. you, you were? We, we, of course, we all took our uniforms off when we, when we finished the classes and we got into our civilian clothes. And yeah, you could, you'd go to the field houses and you would uh, participate in the, uh, the college activities and uh, you'd go down to the town and they were very nice to service people, you know. Mm -hmm. Even though you were too young, the VFW would let you come in and drink beer, you know, and things like this. <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah. So after three months in Louisiana at the college, then did you get special orders to go elsewhere? Yeah, once we finished the uh, course, uh, you know, then you're assigned to duty stations, uh, which they call permanent party. And uh, I was assigned to uh, Eglin Air Force Base, that's E-G-L-I-N, which is uh, near Fort Walton, Florida. It's in the Panhandle, Florida. It's up between Pensacola and Panama City in that area. Nice area. So you went there. Did you get any time off before going down there to visit home? Yes. Mm -hmm. I had a 30-day, uh, uh, what they call a delay in route. It was the same as a furlough. Or and earlier you had said this first duty station was called what? Permanent? Permanent, permanent party. You became party. permanent party personnel. Uh, that's opposed to uh, you know, being transient or, uh, or uh, on temporary duty. This type of so thing. this was a permanent duty, a permanent and duty. you were going to Florida. When you got home for that 30-day leave, did your family and friends see a change in you? Uh, I, don't, I don't think so. Did uh, you see a change in yourself? Yeah, yeah. In what way? Change. Well, I felt that I was a little more cocky, a little more sure of myself, uh, yeah. you know, things like that. Yeah. Do you feel you had matured at all? I, I felt that some although I was still only 17 years sure. old. Sure. <laughs> so then you arrived at Eglin Air Force Base mm -hmm. and checked in to your duty station and what, what, what was it like then and how long were you there for? Uh, let's see, let's see. I was only at Eglin for about, uh, I'd say about four months. It was over the winter. And don't let anybody fool you. It gets it gets cold in the the panhandle of Florida. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I was only there for about four months. And, and were you assigned to a, a particular area of personnel work, desk job work? Uh, I forget the specific uh, uh, office or whatever. But um, if you're a clerk typist or that type of thing, you're you're assigned to a uh, an office or a a function there to where they need typists, you know. And you were there for four months. Did you feel comfortable and fit in pretty well? Or did you uh, find it difficult at I, all? I found it a little bit difficult, uh, a little nervous, you know, going to your first duty station and this type of stuff. And uh, the, the military is a little intimidating, you know, because of the, uh, you know, the structure and whatever. But uh, I, I got the feeling comfortable after a while, sure. Did you remember doing the same thing each day, or was it was it a different type of atmosphere each day? It, as I recall, it was uh, pretty much basically just doing forms, you know, very routine, dull work. You know? mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And after your four-month career in Eglin, what went on after that? Well, then I got orders to uh, 
to go overseas, uh, I was uh, assigned to uh, a <coughs> excuse me, project. They didn't tell you where you were going in those days. They, they would just assign you to project Far Eastern Air Forces. And I said, oh, God, I'm going to Korea. So uh, uh, I, get, I got a, uh, uh, another 30-day uh, leave, I think it was, and then I had to go from there to Camp Stoneman, California. And that was a nice trip. It was a, we took a, it was a train trip from Atlanta to Chicago and Chicago over to uh, San Francisco, and you got to go across the mountains. And you know, you really had gotten out of, uh, away from the first time in your life to really see some of the country, and it was a beautiful country out there. So you remember it vividly? I do, uh, going through, uh, <coughs> through the uh, Rockies and uh, out there. Were yeah. your friends from your hometown still with you at that time, or had they gone no, out? No, they had mm -hmm. long gone somewhere mm -hmm. else. I, so know. how long did the trip take, approximately? To go across country mm -hmm. like that, uh, I was, it was about a three-day trip, train trip. And you arrived in California, mm -hmm. thinking you're going to Korea. Well, uh, didn't really know, but mm -hmm. uh, that's where most people were going at that time, you know, so. Uh, yeah, I arrived there, and uh, that was the port of em debark uh, was it debar embarkation? Yeah, I guess mm -hmm. that's what they'd call it. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, we were there for about a week. Uh, you go through the processing, and you're waiting for a ship. And, uh, and when the ship came in? <laughs> they give you lots of shots. Lots of shots, inoculations of shots. for your... Oh, yeah. Mm. And, and what happened? Well, uh, what you would do is you'd have to stand a formation every day and you'd have your duffel bag with you, fully packed, ready to go. And uh, they would tell you at these formations uh, who, who had a ship or who was, uh, what ship uh, some of the people were going to be on. And what so, would they do? Would they call your name out? they call your name. Mm -hmm. Was it an anxious time for all of you? Yeah, it was. It was. And you were there for a week. Was your name ever called? Week. Well, they finally called it, and as soon as they called uh, call your name, uh, they assigned you what to call a line number, and uh, you would uh, they tell you which ship you were going to be on, and then you would take off and go for that ship. You know, uh, not by yourself, but you know, through a, a group of a whole group. And where were you going on the ship? Well. We, uh, we knew the ship was going to Japan because uh, <coughs> that's where all the, uh, all the troop ships uh, really headed for at that point. And how long, was, how long were you at sea? Going overseas, I was uh, on, on this ship for about seven, it was 17 days. And it's got to be one of the worst experiences of my whole life. Why? Well, I get seasick easily and uh, you're on there with over 3,000 people. and. Uh, uh, it's everything tastes bad, smells bad, you know, and everybody's, and you're feeling sick. everybody's sick. Yeah, you know. What's the old saying? The the first day out, you you're afraid you're going to die, and the second day out, you're afraid you're not going to die. You know, <laughs> and uh, you know, you're in very cramped quarters. You know, you're stacked five deep in these racks, and uh, it's just a just a just a mess. You spend as much time on deck as you could. Very boring too. What was the weather like at sea? Uh, it was, um, for the most part, it was calm and it was warm. Uh, we, uh, we didn't have any problems. We went the more southern route because we, uh, we stopped in uh, Honolulu, and they allowed us to get off the ship for a whole day in uh, Honolulu, so that was a nice experience. So you're able to see some beautiful areas of the country that you probably would not have been able We've to never see. Have gone, yeah. Mm -hmm. But you were, <laughs> you were off the ship in the morning, you had to be on the ship there that uh, same day and you were leaving that evening. So. And then 17 days into your trip you arrived in Japan? We arrived in Yokohama. Mm -hmm. What was that like? Well, it was, it was, it was kind of like you see in the old World War II movies, you know, you get off the ship and you're carrying your duffel bags and here's the Red Cross with their uh, donuts and uh, you know, all this type of stuff. But uh, it was basically off the ship onto trains. And uh, you, uh, that's, that's how they separated uh, the Korean bound from the other bound, was uh, uh, you were on the train for about a day, I think it was, and uh, 
you went, you, once you arrived at a little town called Iwakuni, which was a Marine Corps Naval Air, uh, Marine Corps Air Station, as I recall, um, that's where the people going to Korea got off the train and, you know, got other, on other uh, conveyances. And uh, me, I stayed on the train. It's that, it was at that point I found out I was going to uh, southern Japan, uh, a base called Itazuki. Uh, what was the name? The air base is called Itazuki, I-T-A-Z-U-K-E. Were you disappointed that you weren't getting off and going? No, not really. Mm -hmm. No, I figured Japan would be a good assignment. And how long were you at Itazuki? I was at Itazuki for, uh, mm, it was a little over a year. It, uh, the normal tour of duty at that point was three years, but Izuki was was a combat base. They flew they flew combat missions in in and out of Korea, so um, you were um, you were rotated just like uh, uh, combat units. Even though we weren't in any sort of combat, that's for sure. So while the planes were flying in and out, you were at a desk duty station. Right. Basic mm -hmm. Izuki was uh, was uh, divided up into two. Uh, locations. One was what they called the Strip, which is where they flew their their uh, missions from, and the other base was what they called Base One, and that was more of the administrative and uh, uh, thing. I was in what they call an AC and W group. It's Aircraft Control and Warning, and uh, what they do is they uh, they they position uh, radar uh, sites on top of the mountains and uh, uh, you know for early warning. This type of stuff. Plus, it's for aircraft control as well. Do you remember, because you would probably see some of the f planes going in and out, and also if you had these warning signals set up, any anxious moments with regards to planes either not making it or barely making it? Or well, uh, the the office that I worked in uh, had access to to casualty uh, reports and uh, aircraft losses. And uh, we would see almost on a daily basis uh, the aircraft that were lost. And uh, we actually lost quite a few aircraft. How did it affect all of you? I mean, you weren't, as you said, you weren't in direct combat, but you certainly were keeping track of this information. So everybody's job was important to the time. Mm -hmm. What was it like for you each day, knowing that more casualties were happening? Well, uh, you, you felt an, an affinity for them, uh, but yet it was it was far enough away that it uh, didn't uh, it didn't really bother us that that much. Uh, we uh, we actually lived pretty good on the base, you know. And you felt safe. Oh yes. Mm -hmm. There was one time, uh, and they well more than one time it happened, but the first time was a little scary is what they, for some reason, the, uh, the South Korean Air Force would come over and mock strafe your base. With, uh, they were flying the American P-51s at the time. And you know, they, <laughs> it gave you a bit of an idea of what it was like to be under an attack, uh, you know, but, uh, but it was just a mock attack. So it was a practice for them? Yes. Mm -hmm. Sort of realistic for you, though. Yeah, yeah. So you were there for a year. Um, certainly developing the skills um, that you had gone to school for. Um, was there any point in time that you had the ability to get other, um, you mentioned I think that your initial promotion was PFC, PFC. Yeah. other promotions? Well, uh, I became, a, the next rank was, at, the, uh, the, at this time they, they changed over to the Air Force ranking system. That, the PFC was the equivalent of what they call an airman third class, so uh, I became an airman second class, which was equivalent to a corporal in the Army. And after a year in Itazuki... Itazuki, it by the way, was, was located uh, on the island of Kyushu, K-Y-U-S-H-U, and it was near the town of Fukuoka, uh, F-U-K-U-O-K-A. And uh, that, they run a big road race there. Uh, Did they at that time, or they do now? Not at, not at that time, but you got to remember that this was 1952. Was only seven years after the war, and uh, so uh, they were still 
uh, pretty uh, destitute in a lot of cases. Uh, Did you see a lot of um, casualties of war? Uh, not really, not mm -hmm. really. Um, we, uh, a friend and I took a three-day pass one time and went to uh, Nagasaki, mm -hmm. uh, which was the atomic bomb, the second atomic bomb uh, location. What was it like? Because that would have been a number of years later. What was that was like? About seven years afterwards. Mm -hmm. uh, it had been cleaned up pretty well, but uh, they had a, uh, they had a, uh, what they call a peace park. And, uh, you know, they had signs with all the casualties and di the different things that had happened there. And uh, also, uh, we went to a, uh, a bombed out Catholic church, which was kind of strange to find in Japan. But, uh, and uh, I have pictures of it. And uh, it, uh, you know, it just gave you an idea of the, uh, the damage and what have you. While you were on the island and, and able to go to uh, Nagasaki and places like that, were you able to initiate any kind of communications with the members of the communities that you were in? Not really. Not did really. you really stay pretty separate? Uh, we, uh, yes, yeah, we did. Uh, we, uh, we didn't, we didn't uh, mix with the, uh, the indigenous personnel too, mm -hmm. too much. Uh, Although the office that I worked in happened to be a supply office, and we were fortunate enough that the, uh, a lot of the Japanese contractors would come in and take you out and buy you dinner and all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this mm -hmm. type of stuff. But, uh, Did you, were you able to get involved in any of the cultures of Japan, the food or anything like that? Uh, we, uh, we, we ate out as, as, as much as we could, you know. So you were willing to experience things other than the typical American Air Force meal? Oh, yes, mm -hmm. yes. Oh, did absolutely. you enjoy it? I did, yeah. And today? Oh, even today. I'm an avid fan of Japanese, Chinese. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, after Itasuki, where did you go? Well, I got back on another troop ship there and uh, spent another 18 days this time coming back to the States. Uh, we didn't stop in ha Hawaii at this time. We took the northern route and it was very cold. Uh, but uh, yeah, it took us about 18 days to get back to a place called Treasure Island, which is near San Francisco. And uh, from there, we well, we all had our orders, and my orders were to I was being reassigned to the 463rd Troop Carrier Wing, which was at Memphis Municipal Airport in Tennessee. I said, "This is great. I'm go you know." It's always nice in the military is if, if you can be stationed at a place other than a military uh, or a base or something because you, you don't get involved with all the, uh, uh, you know, all the drilling and the, uh, the duties and whatever. So, and were you, did you also feel that you were that much closer to home? Uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was good because it was closer to Atlanta, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, been a, would be able to get there. Uh, you know, without too much train. But the thing is, I, I got to Atlanta, and I, we, we again had about a 30-day leave. In the, in the military, you get 30 days uh, per year. And uh, so after I spent my 30 days there, I, I, I drove, I bought a car, <laughs> we'll be up there, and drove to... Uh, Do you remember what it was? Yeah, it was a 1947 Oldsmobile. 1947 Oldsmobile. It was a hunk of junk, but my first car, you know, and didn't got you where enough. you were going uh, for a while. <laughs> <laughs> so after your leave, and you bought a car, and you went to Tennessee. I drove to Memphis, which was, you know, only a day's drive from Atlanta, and uh, I go to report in, and uh, they say, "Well, we've been trying to get hold of you uh, because apparently." The uh, your home address or your home record, mine had had changed or something, and they'd never gotten the word for it or whatever. But anyway, the uh, the fact of the matter was was that the whole organization, the 463rd Troop Carrier Wing, had moved out of Memphis Municipal Airport, and uh, they said that it had moved to Oklahoma. And I said, Oh God! So I said, Where in Oklahoma is is this uh, place? 
and they said it was, they had built a brand new Air Force base, and they said it was in a town called Gene Autry, Oklahoma. I says, where in the world is Gene Autry, Oklahoma? And come to find out it was uh, actually about 20 miles outside of a town called Ardmore, Oklahoma. And I, I said, where's Ardmore, Oklahoma? <laughs> uh, but uh, it, it was a brand new base, and that's what they call it, Ardmore Air Force Base. And you were reassigned there then? Right. I spent the night in Memphis and uh, drove, drove to Oklahoma the next day. Again, that was about a day's drive. Whatever. So you get to another area of the country that you'd never been to, and unexpectedly. Unexpectedly. Were you upset about it, or just were you the type that went with the flow of change? Well, I, I, uh, I was a little upset about it, but I uh, you know, had kind of come to take everything as it came effectively, you know. Was it what you expected, newer, better, nicer? It was a nice air force, nice air base. It was brand new, uh, but it was located in, like I say, it was about 20 miles outside of Ardmore, and, and Ardmore wasn't the biggest town in the world either. And uh, generally, GIs like to be near populations, you know, because there's things to do and mm -hmm. girls to meet, things like this. Uh, <laughs> and at this point in time, you were still single. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but it was, it was a nice air base. I mean, it was two man rooms, a sink in the room, you know, a closet. What was the weather like as compared to where you had been? The weather in Oklahoma is very, very extreme sometimes. In the summer, you know, almost every day you get, a, uh, you get a severe weather warning, you know, the tornado alleys and all this type of thing. Were you ever involved in a tornado out there? Never was. Mm -hmm. Never was. You know, I, I tell people, I say, I was, I was born in Georgia, spent my life in the South, spent good time in Oklahoma, other, other air bases in the South, and my first tornado I saw in Massachusetts. <laughs> <laughs> and I did. It was up around uh, uh, Chelmsford mm -hmm. one day. We were coming back from uh, somewhere, this friend of mine, and uh, it, was a, it wasn't a tight twister-like thing, but a big round circulation, you know, and it tore up a few trees, but nothing bad. Fascinating. Yeah. So how long were you um, settled in in Ardmore? I stayed at Ardmore for about, uh, I guess about 18 months, somewhere in that neighborhood. I worked at the, uh, the base hospital. Uh, I was originally assigned to the troop carrier wing, but uh, I got reassigned. I was reassigned to the uh, the base hospital. So, did you do clerical type of work at the hospital? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like yeah. an orderly might or. Well, uh, what, we, we what, did we did records and you know correspondence and uh, uh, that type of thing. Were there hazards of war coming into that hospital or no. what no. types of? Um, by this time, this when was this? Uh, I think the Korean War. They'd signed the truce, and uh, uh, so what type of injuries or illnesses were at this hospital? <laughs> Mainly, it was uh, the hospital was uh, uh, accommodated primarily uh, pregnant women, uh, people like that. And were they all service connected? Oh yeah, and uh, you know accident cases and things of this nature. Uh, it wasn't a very big hospital. Uh, if there were serious cases, uh, what they would do is that they would uh, send them down to Shepherd Air Force Base, which was in uh, Wichita Falls, Texas, which wasn't too far away, and uh, they had better hospital facilities there. So d you lived on the base. I lived on the base. And the hospital was there. How large a population lived on the base? It was about a 3,000 men uh, air base. You were there for 18 months. How long a tour of duty were you supposed to have when you initially signed up? Uh, four years. Four years. Mm -hmm. uh, I re-enlisted at, uh, at Oklahoma because this was, at this time it was 1955. My enlistment was up, so I re-enlisted. What made you decide to re-enlist? Well, I was uh, hoping to make, uh, make the military career. Uh, and there was a girl there that I, I thought the world of, you know. <laughs> and what happened? Yeah, she thought the world of somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, 
this was a troop carrier base. Uh, trap, troop, it, it was a, uh, the wing was a troop carriers, and they, they flew uh, uh, C, C-119s and uh, C-122s, which, uh, which effectively uh, hauled uh, paratroopers around, you know, for drops and things of this nature, as well as uh, equipment. They, uh, they were sort of a work, work base for, for the 18th Air Force, which I subsequently wound up at. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, they would be issued a certain, uh, certain orders to, to go here to do this, or go here to do that, or go there and pick up this, or whatever. You know. So once you re-enlisted, mm -hmm. and you were still in Ardmore? I was. And so did your tour extend there, or did they send you out elsewhere? Uh, it, it extended there. Uh, however, it was about, well, I guess about four months later or something like that, I'm not sure, uh, that I, was, I got my orders for reassignment to, uh, I was being assigned to Donaldson Air Force Base, that's D-O-N-A-L-D-S-O-N, -S which was in Greenville, South Carolina which is just right up the road from Atlanta. <laughs> Were you happy about that? Uh, I, I was happy about that, yeah. yeah. Mm. And did you get there? I did. Yeah, mm -hmm. and how long were you there for? I was in Greenville about um, uh, almost a couple of years. Were you able to get home a lot? Almost every weekend. So, so you had almost an office job type of situation. That's what was good about it. it was It was sort of an eight to five type thing. Mm -hmm. Although while I was at, at Donaldson, uh, uh, they, they flew, uh, again it was troop carrier, but they flew the heavier troop carriers, the C-124s, the big, the big babies and what have you. And I was in the 18th, I was assigned to the 18th Air Force Headquarters. Uh, and I worked in the, what they call the Transport Movement Control Center. And uh, not only did you do clerical functions, but you had to plot aircraft and uh, all this type of stuff. And uh, from all the bases that were under it, uh, including Ardmore. <coughs> and uh, it was there. I was in the movies one night. And uh, all of a sudden, I see my name flashed on the screen up there to, to report to a certain place. So, so I go up there, and they tell me, they say, 6 o'clock in the morning, we want you to report down here, check out Arctic gear, because you're going to have to go on a, oh, I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself here. Uh, let's go back a little bit, but uh, okay. uh, while I was at Donaldson, I, I uh, got a chance to go to stenography school, which was uh, in Fort Harrison, Indiana, which is in Indianapolis. You know about that? Yes, we were stationed there actually after my really? husband was in Vietnam for nine really? months. Yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah. I liked Indianapolis. It was a nice place. Yes. But uh, anyway, I was there for four months uh, to uh, for stenography school, steno school. Did stenography help you in your later life? It did. Mm. It helped me as far as the Air Force was concerned and everything because it it really opened up a lot of uh, avenues. Uh, uh, that you wouldn't have as just a, just a typist. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, when I finished steno school and went back to uh, South Carolina, uh, I put in uh, applications for special assignments you, because you could, you could get embassy duty, you could get attaché duties, mm -hmm. uh, things of that nature. I mean, you could, there was a lot of places in the world you could go, you know, uh, to you name it, you, whether it was an embassy or whatever, you could, you could go. <laughs> but as it turned out, I, I didn't get any of them. <laughs> but anyway, uh, since I was a steno stenographer, that's the reason they, they, they had me go to this on this uh, Arctic uh, thing. So sure enough, the next morning I checked out all this Arctic gear and we were on a C-124 and we were on our way to the Arctic. At the time, they, uh, uh, the 18th Air Force and the planes that it controlled supplied the, uh, what they called the dew line sites, the distant early warning uh, sites, which was a ring uh, way up in the uh, Arctic Circle, uh, you know, above Canada. <coughs> and they also resupplied the McMurdo and the, uh, the South Pole uh, 
uh, bases down there. Uh, that was one of their functions. And um, they even, at one time there, they uh, flew, uh, uh, they flew the Spirit of St. Louis. I don't know if you've ever seen the movie with Jimmy Stewart, Spirit mm. of St. Louis. They, they flew that plane. They were assigned to that group and they flew that plane in various places, you know. So. <laughs> but anyway, we, uh, uh, that next morning we took off. Well, uh, shortly we were in Montjoly, Canada. We picked up a, a big supply of uh, electronics gear. Then went to Goose, Goose Bay, Labrador the same day and uh, we got snowed in in Goose Bay for a couple of days. And from there, we went to, uh, we went to Frobisher Bay, and then went to the Baffin Islands. And you're talking about coal, it was, it was coal. And uh, from there, we, we flew the C-124. Uh, I didn't fly it, I was just on it and landed on a very small ice strip at one of the Dewline sites, which was, I always thought was extraordinary, you know? It's it, funny, you're landing and you're taxiing on this thing, you see these wrecks off to the side, airplanes that, uh, you know, haven't made it. But, and, uh, it was a... When you land on these ice strips, do they have shelters set up there, or did you then have to take vehicles off and elsewhere? Uh, well, once you got off the plane, they, they uh, uh, you got in a, a, a car, like, and they, they took you to a, a shelter. You know. Landing on these ice strips, were you able to see exactly what it, what he, the pilots were landing on? Did uh, you know ahead of time? Not really, because the C-124 was a very big airplane, and uh, you were generally in the back. How and, many uh, were with you on the plane? Uh, what it was for was to, uh, to, it was an aircraft accident investigating board. And uh, there must have been about five or six, and it was headed by uh, an Air Force colonel. And I was going to be the stenographer that, that took the notes and uh, all this stuff. So were they investigating an accident in the Arctic? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There was an air, airplane crash up there. But as it turned out, uh, for some reason, it had already been taken care of. So we just turned out to be a big boondoggle for us. <laughs> so you got all the way up there to the Arctic. How long were you there for? Uh, we, uh, we didn't stay overnight. Uh, we, uh, let me see, we actually flew, flew all the way back to South Carolina, I believe. You yeah. mentioned earlier that you had a lot of electronic equipment supplies. Is there ever any thought that it might have been for something other than what they stated? No, no, mm -hmm. no, because uh, again, the mission of these these big cargo uh, transport ships were to uh, to haul this stuff around. And uh, when we the place we stopped, it was in Montjoly, which is in Quebec on the Gaspé Peninsula up there. Uh, uh, there was a Western Electric plant there, and um, th this was a big a piece of electronic equipment. I, I assume that they would use up in there the dew line somewhere. Mm -hmm. So you only stayed over a day and then you went back to Greenville? Greenville. Mm -hmm. And did you just take up where you left off? I went back to uh, the, uh, my regular duty assignment, sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. So at this point in time you're in the service, uh, my estimation is what, five plus years or so? Uh, almost six, five mm -hmm. plus, yeah, almost mm -hmm. six. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And were you stationed, you said two years in Greenville? About two years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So then after that, what occurred? Well, the, uh, I, uh, I was reassigned. For, uh, they asked me if I would wanted the assignment. And uh, I, I said, yeah, I was uh, reassigned to the, uh, to the Pentagon, uh, to the uh, Joint Chiefs of Staff, as a matter of fact. And uh, I told them, I said, uh, yeah, I, 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 I would like that assignment, but uh, I want my requests for special assignments to remain in effect. And they said, oh yeah, no problem. Meaning embassies or embassies, places whatever. like that. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I was hoping to still get one of those assignments, you mm -hmm. know, because you'd go to Denmark, God knows wherever, you know. But the Pentagon must have been a little bit exciting for you to consider also. Yeah. Or you was. thought it was. No. Uh, 
I, I liked the, the duty there. All that was hard work and everything. How long were you there for? I was there for a little over four years. A little over four years. Who, were, who did you directly report to? When I, uh, when I first got to the uh, Pentagon, uh, we were assigned to what they call a JCS, a Joint Chiefs of Staff uh, uh, Detachment, which, uh, which uh, was different from everybody else because everybody else lived on the base. But we, we actu I actually lived on, on the uh, Fort Myer for a, for a short time, Fort Myer South Post. And I'm prone to tell everybody, you know, the cemetery there. I said I lived in that cemetery for quite a while <laughs> because it was. It's right there in the cemetery, you know. And, uh, was that impressive to you when you first saw that? Oh, it really was. Oh, my, my. It was such an enormous cemetery. Mm -hmm. And if you ever had the chance to go see the changing of the guard and things like this, uh, and uh, we we would oft I would often go up into Fort Myer, the North Post, is where they had all the. Uh, uh, the, they had the old guard, and they provided the uh, soldiers for the burials and stuff like this. And mm -hmm. uh, it was almost every day, you, uh, two or three burials a day. You know. At that time, anybody in the military could, could be buried at Arlington, but that since changed. Because they were running out of room? Just running out of space, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. That's the reason I get a little upset sometimes when I hear about some of these guys trying to weasel their way in there, you know, or something like this. And uh, uh, veterans tend to you know, regardless of what they were involved in or, or whether they were combat or non-combat, they, they tend to have a uh, form of bond, to, you know. And uh, we tend not to appreciate some people. Do you feel that the Pentagon was a worthwhile experience? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Met my wife there. You met your wife there. That's very <laughs> worthwhile. Yeah. Did she work there also? Uh, yeah, she did. She, uh, she, well, she was only there for a short time. She had just graduated from college, and uh, she was there to work for the Navy Department. Did you both have to have special clearance? Oh, yeah. Top secret clearance. In, in doing that type of clearance, did they investigate you back home? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did right. that concern your family, your parents? No, but it scared a couple of people to have the FBI come knocking at the door. <laughs> <laughs> sure, sure. So you were there for approximately four years. I got uh, there in March of 57 and I left in May of 61, so a little over four years. So you saw a number of different um, presidents during your, or you worked under a, a number of different presidents during your stay. Were you able to meet any of them? or even peripherally meet them? Uh, no, although uh, <clears throat> I did see Eisenhower, uh, uh, and I saw Khrushchev, uh, you know, but so did about eight million other people standing out by the roadside. Uh, and uh, a lot of people came to the Pentagon, you know, the, the Shah of Iran was there, and uh, uh, the uh, king of Saudi Arabia was there, and mm -hmm. uh, you know, people like that. So you knew offhand that there may be someone coming in of importance because, what, security was tightened? What well, was uh, I didn't really know that they were coming. I just kind of saw them after the fact, you know, mm -hmm. this type of thing. What was a typical day like working at the Pentagon? Uh, for the most part, it was just routine. You'd, you'd, you'd come in in the morning. It was, it was basically an eight to five job. You'd come in in the morning. Uh, and you would, uh, you know, do your job. Uh, I, when I first got there, I, I was assigned to the Joint Middle East Planning Committee, which had just come from Baghdad. And uh, they were set up in teams, which, which, uh, which is true of a lot of uh, directorates in the, uh, in the uh, joint, joint Staff. And uh, the team has consisted of uh, uh, at least a colonel or, or a captain rank from each of the services, Army, Navy, and the Air Force. And uh, what they do basically is they, they come up and they write position papers and things of this nature. And uh, so I was assigned to, to one of these uh, teams. And uh, it was uh, yeah, pretty routine, although we, we did get to do a lot of, they, they did a lot of uh, briefings and things of this nature. And uh, one of my experiences or remembrances is that uh, we, uh, we had to brief uh, a committee in Congress, and we, we actually went to the Capitol and 
you know, I was the guy that sat there with the, uh, you know, with the flip charts and all this type of stuff. <laughs> but were you impressed by the fact that you were a part of all of that too? Yeah, in a way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, I was, I was, I was just kind of impressed of where I was because, uh, from a military point of view, you know, this is the the top, where the top dogs are. Sure. And uh, yeah, but it was, it was. It was hard work, and being in this Middle East Planning Committee that we were, I was, I had actually been on, uh, I had gone home for a short leave, and I got called back. <coughs> I got a call. At the time, the, uh, the king of Iraq, at that time there was a king of Iraq, had been overthrown and was dragged through the streets and all of this type of stuff, and uh, so they called me back because the, these people were constantly doing position papers and things uh, regarding the Middle East. And uh, we, were, we were 12 on, 12 off. We actually had to sleep in the Pentagon. Mm -hmm. We got awful place to, to sleep on cots, and, you know, it was mm -hmm. a mess. Yeah. So you're in the thick of it during a, a, oh, yeah. an overthrow of a government, or in this a sovereignty? In this case, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. And well, yeah, it was, I, found, I found working, especially in this place, a, a very educational experience, too, because being a, being a stenographer, these people were always dictating to you uh, the things about, uh, uh, you know, the Middle East and uh, Azerbaijan, and you know, you get to know all these terms. And these guys were constantly back and forth, and they would bring you things, uh, you know, from from Baghdad. And uh, were you uh, able to do any of any traveling over there at all? Not no. at all. Since your experiences working there and, and being sort of in the thick of uh, position papers on the Middle East. Have you taken a particular interest in what's occurred since then? Mm -hmm. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Was that your last duty station prior to leaving the Air Force? Uh, the, the Pentagon was my last duty station, yes. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I worked, uh, the, the Middle East Planning Committee dissolved and I, I went to work for uh, Atomic Energy and Guided Missile Branch and of course you got to <laughs> Uh, I hear about a lot of things there too, you know. Was it difficult because some of the things, we, if you went home on a typical weekend, some of the things you couldn't talk about? Well, you, you couldn't talk about these things, no. Everything was, everything was very classified because uh, there were some very sensitive uh, things going on. If, that uh, they were actually a lot of contingency plans and things of this, uh, you know, that, that might have involved, you know, bombing this or whatever. You know. Did you find that your group was involved with other organizations in, at the state level besides the Pentagon, right. CIA, we, NSA, any of that? Uh, not them so much. Uh, we were primarily, uh, of course, we were the Department of Defense, and uh, uh, that's, that's who we dealt with mainly, but the, the State Department was uh, involved a lot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What do you, looking back, what were some of the great challenges that you think you might have had, in, in spite of the fact that you were non-combat, non-combat, but that you did experience an overseas uh, time, and you also experienced working at the Pentagon? What what stands out in your mind? What few things do you think of when you when you think about some of the challenges that you faced? Well, I I don't I don't really feel that I faced an awful lot of challenges, uh, really. I think it's pretty much, pretty much just routine, you know. And a good experience for you? Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Yeah, I think so. Uh, I, I felt that uh, in the military, I, uh, I, 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 I educated myself. I found that, you know, going to the University of Maryland. When I got back here, I went to Northeastern. Um, I found it was. Uh, the military in general is, is a good experience. Uh, I, I think everybody should experience part of it anyway. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when you uh, were able to go back to school, did you use the GI Bill to mm -hmm. help support that? I did. Mm -hmm. You mentioned earlier also that you met your wife at the Pentagon. Now, you were there through 61. When did you and your wife get married? We got married in 1959. Mm -hmm. Actually, I, I had seen her there. She didn't stay at the Pentagon too long. She, uh, she was a medical secretary, so she, uh, she was, uh, <coughs> got a job with a doctor and was working in that field. Uh, I actually met her uh, 
I was going with another girl at the time, and she was at, at her house. Mm -hmm. So that's how that started. <laughs> so you were a, 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 fam a military young family living on base. Not on base. Uh, there was there was no uh, base facilities to speak of for, for, for most people. Mm -hmm. uh, we uh, we lived in uh, when we got married. We we actually first lived in Arlington, right off of uh, Arlington. Yeah. Arlington. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, Columbia Pike was the street we lived on. Mm -hmm. And uh, the bus to work every day. A regular job, regular but job. you happen to be yeah. working with the Air Force. Uh, before I got married, though, I, uh, since I was in the JCS detachment uh, uh, and there were no quarters, we had to leave off, live off post, and uh, that was kind of tough because I was still sending an allotment to my mother and, sure. you know, and things like this. And, uh, but and I, I took a part-time job. I, I worked part-time at uh, at a company called Melpar, which is a defense uh, uh, company in Falls Church, Virginia. So while you were in the service, you were able to work a part-time job. Yes. Mm -hmm. mm. This is in the latter part of when I was at the uh, JCS. Uh, the first part there, like I say, they kept you kept you going with the Middle East situation, being what it was. But mm -hmm. other than that, though, no, it was just basically eight to five. So did you go to school after you finished completed your duties in the Air Force? I went to school while I was there. While you were there at the University of Maryland, which you would have classes in the Pentagon. Right? And, uh, and, uh, Did you I, get a bachelor's degree at that time? No, no, mm -hmm. I, I never got a degree. I, uh, I never finished. Uh, but what was your specialty that you... Business manager. Business, mm -hmm. okay. And you left the military in 1961. At the time you were living in or around that area. Did you move home to South Carolina? Or did you move up this way at that time? Uh, my wife was uh, from Massachusetts, and uh, at the time too, I was I was trying to make a decision whether I was going to stay in the service because uh, ten years, you know, it's it's tough. Uh, it's it's a time to decide whether you want to get in, stay in, or get out. And uh, things in the Air Force just weren't that great promotion-wise, and uh, uh, I did have a family to take care of, so um, I knew some very high-ranking guys and. Uh, I was offered a job at Raytheon, so that uh, <laughs> I decided to get out and go to work at Raytheon. So, her being from up here and the the job being at Raytheon over in Bedford uh, is what brought me up here. And did you do a lot of work through Raytheon with the military? Uh, yeah, I mean that that was their that was Specialty. their primary uh, customer. Uh, I I didn't deal with them too much, but uh, uh, I ran a uh, I was in data management, if you will. Uh, actually, I ran a library. Uh, it was a well, it wasn't a library like this. It was a technical library, and uh, we like to think that we were one of the first to really get uh, automated and uh, go on the computer, and uh, because we uh, we had a very sophisticated setup there at, uh, at Raytheon. Information storage and retrieval. Really? Back when it really was just beginning. That's right. Mm -hmm. all we, our computer was a big Univac down the hall. and Probably as large as this room. Uh, <laughs> bigger, probably as big as this building. And uh, you communicated with it through uh, TTY machines, you know, this type of thing. How long were you with Raytheon? I was there almost 15 years. Did you retire from Raytheon? I got laid off. You got laid off. <laughs> That Doesn't thing. everybody? <laughs> <laughs> and then from Raytheon, what did you do? Well, while I was working at Raytheon, I, uh, I had uh, picked up a, bought out a, a small business uh, a letter shop. And uh, it was actually run by a little old lady up here on Central Street. Uh, it, was, it was called Central Letter Shop. And it was across from the uh, Lincoln School, I believe it was. The Lincoln School now being the Kennedy Senior Center okay. and the courthouse yes, just yes, for yes, yes. public information. Yes. And uh, I, I bought that just sort of as a part-time venture and uh, I got laid off and I said, well, I may as well try and develop this and that was 76, so I've been at it ever since. So you still are working at that. Yeah. How important do you think 
serving in the military was. I know you alluded earlier to the fact that you think everyone should in some capacity. Mm. You felt it helped you to grow? I do. I, I think it, uh, it does a lot for a person. It, uh, it uh, puts you in group situations, uh, let, let you uh, learn to take direction, uh, uh, let you know that you're not the, the only cheese, big cheese in town. Uh, discipline. Uh. One of the questions that I ask a number of our veterans that we've interviewed, and I would like to ask you at this time too, is what you feel about the difference of public opinion regarding the veterans from the World War II generation versus those from the Korean conflict, which would have been your generation and those from the Vietnam. Mm generation? Well, if, if you listen to people talk, you think Vietnam was the only war that ever, that ever occurred. And uh, we all know that's not so. Uh, Korea, you lost something like 55,000 troops, and it was a tough war. It was cold, and it was, uh, I mean, those guys went through an awful lot over there. In the Second World War, uh, you know, they've all just kind of been forgotten. And uh, the people that served in the uh, Second War and, and in the Viet and in the Korean War, we we didn't feel that anything particularly was owed to us. We we felt we had the duty, and, and we went and did it. And uh, we didn't expect anything, uh, you know, extraordinary about it. Uh, I have a lot of respect for the guys that were in the Vietnam War, but I think they they complain an awful lot, and uh, uh, you know. Their experiences may be bad, but the other people had bad experiences as well. Is there any thought or comment, memory, statement that you would like to leave us with? Something that you may leave not only for your family to hear, but certainly people in the future who may be doing research and viewing these tapes? Uh. No, I have nothing that I can really think of. Uh, it, uh <laughs> you had mentioned earlier about person that you feel that everyone should have a stand in the military. Do you feel men and in, in this generation, men and women alike? Uh, not really. <laughs> men. Uh, I I don't go along with I, I you know women have been in the service for a long time and. Uh, I, they are no problem, but I. But when they start putting them on ships and in combat units and uh, things of this nature, I, I just don't go along with it. Uh, I, I don't think it's uh, necessary. I, I don't think that they add anything. I, I may be hurting somebody's feelings, but uh, I, I just that's the way I feel about it. You know? Personal opinions are accepted here. Yeah, believe me. <laughs> We'd like to thank you this afternoon for sharing another story in another side of life in the military with not only your family but with other viewers of this tape. Thank you again, Mr. Okay. Calhoun. My pleasure. Thanks. Right on.